All right, welcome into Gridiron Icon this week, and I'm excited because I'm having a special guest and friend return to the show, Michael Murtis, creator of The Quarterback Project Online. He takes a fantastic look at NFL quarterbacks throughout history, ranks them top 100 with all sorts of interesting criteria, and this week we're going to do something special we're going to take a look at the top five Rams quarterbacks of all time. And I guess we're going to have to do Los Angeles. We're going to have to do St. Louis. We're going to have to do a little Cleveland, maybe. My friend, Michael Murtis, welcome in, my man. Hey, Stacy. Thanks so much for having me back. We had a lot of fun last time. Looking forward to it uh, here now. I appreciate it. I got to tell you, I, I've got these plans in my mind that you're going to be a regular on here every so often. We're going to go straight old 70s, 80s talk show where we have this returning guest that talks certain sub vertical subjects, in this case, quarterbacks. Love what you're doing at the Quarterback Project, folks. And we'll reiterate that website at the end as well. So thanks, my friend. My pleasure. All right. So let's talk some quarterbacks. Let's talk about this. So this is a special episode. We're going to hone in on a group of quarterbacks that are very important to me. They might be a little emotional. I might push back. I might ask a few questions on your rankings and your criteria because these guys are all some of the, my favorite players all time in my lifetime as a unabashed Los Angeles Rams fan. So we're going to take a look at the top five Rams quarterbacks. But before we jump into that, can you just give us a quick few seconds on the quarterback project, why you wanted to do this, why it's a passion project, and, and we'll start talking criteria. Yeah, definitely. It was something I kind of got into, I think, back in high school. I'd come home from class, and NFL films would be on, the uh, Super Bowl episodes, basically. And so I got to learn about all these Bart Starr, Len Dawson, Roger Staubach, and just sort of built an interest into it. It was always something I was kind of curious about, but never really had the wherewithal to do. And then a few years back, it was the 100th anniversary of the NFL, and with my free time, I thought, let's bust out the spreadsheets and see if I can come out with a way to compare quarterbacks, but by their respective eras. So, for example, you can't compare Otto Graham to Terry Bradshaw to Drew Brees. The numbers just don't – they don't work. All the, all the top quarterbacks would be the quarterbacks from the past 10, 20 years. So I compare them by the respective years they played, the average quarterback statistics of those years, and see – who are the best quarterbacks of all time compared to their respective era? I love it, man. And for folks, if, if you're just now meeting Michael on this show, go back and look at our first episode where we became friends, basically, because I reached out to him on Twitter. I loved his blog. Uh, take a look at that first episode. He goes deep into what drove the quarterback project. But there's, there's a little bit of a uh, macro level jump off for us. Okay, let's talk Rams. Uh, or should I say, Michael, I got to tell you, I, I want to talk world champion Rams. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, you're, you're slipping a little bit, Stacey. Usually that's the first thing you lead with. Hey, you know what you should because you got 32 NFL teams. One gets to be called the world champion every year. So you milk that for all it's worth because you gonna, never know if next year is going to bring that back to you. Oh, it's going to be tough, man, to run it back. It's always tough. But I'll tell you, man. I couldn't be more excited, and you're right. I'm going to get some mileage out of that. Uh, I might even ask you a couple of modern-day questions not on the yeah. list or farther down the list. We'll get to that. But let's talk Rams quarterbacks. I let's can't love this subject enough. So just taking a look for those listening in, because this is such an emotionally loaded subject mm -hmm. for people, let's take a look at the criteria for why you ranked these top five guys as the top five Rams quarterback in history. And please correct me where I'm wrong, folks. You can get this all on the quarterback project, uh, org. but minimum of 30 game starts, correct? Mm -hmm. That's and correct. That, yep. Regular okay. season starts. Yes. Minimum okay. of 30. Okay. So we're looking at a roughly 11 players that fit in under that umbrella, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. right out of the way. So for all you old timers, Iconic Rams lovers. We're not going to talk about Bob Waterfield, right? He had only 22 games started. We'll give him an honorable mention because he should be mentioned. He's a Hall oh. of Famer, oh, but yeah. since my criteria really starts at 1950 and the bulk of his work was in the late 40s, he just didn't play enough post-1950 to qualify for this study. But legend in his own right. He deserves oh. recognition for that. Yeah, Absolutely. And this is one of the few times, my friend, where I can say, 
Oh, goody. I can't say I was alive and watched this player to my day. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's right. Bob, I've, I'm in the same boat you are. All the old NFL films with Bob Waterfield. Incredible Ram. Uh, we tip our hat. Honorable mention. Okay. 1950 forward, 11 guys. So just to be clear for all you diehard Rams quarterback lovers out there, we're not going to talk about Joe Namath. Well, whopping four games that no yeah. one wants to remember, including Joe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah unfortunately, we're not going to talk, yeah. we're not talk about Jeff Rutledge, Dieter Brock, Steve Walsh, Burt Jones, all these great, well, I mean, great's a strong word. Ram quarterbacks. We'll just say That's Ram right. quarterbacks didn't I'll make the you, list. Stacey, we'll save the Dieter Brock conversation for your CFL <laughs> podcast. How's that sound? Oh, well, my that, God. Then we can talk about them then. Yeah. We're going to do that. I, I honestly think that we should connect and we should do something along the lines of great forgotten one year wonders or something of that nature, you, which you you actually tap into some of that on That'd quarterback be front. That'd yeah. be a lot of fun. Okay. Let's jump in. We're going to start from honorable mention and work our way to number one with Michael here, folks. Honorable mention. I was really impressed with the guys listed. I happened to notice Jared Goff wasn't on the list. Oh, I know. I know. Jer Jared Goff was, let's put it this way. He was an above average quarterback for his five years in the Rams. He wasn't a great one, but he certainly was not a bad one. He was an above average quarterback. He, of the 11 guys I ranked, and again, I'm not a statistician. This is just a formula I put together, and it's based upon that comparison that I gave you in terms of the the guys that were quarterbacking at the same time they were. Even though he was eighth, he was still slightly above average. The Rams have been blessed with great quarterbacks. They are one of only two franchises, the other being the Packers, to have three guys, three quarterbacks in the Pro Football Hall of Fame who played the prime of their careers for that respective franchise. And Goff, if he was for comparison purposes, because I've done this for other teams as well on my site, if he had been on the Chicago Bears and put up the same numbers, he'd be number three on the list. Wow. So it just goes to show you it's maybe less a criticism of Jared Goff and more a compliment of the history of quarterbacking the Rams have. How's that sound if it makes you feel a little bit better than that on the list? <laughs> he's um, totally – he's placating yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah, no, but seriously, though, I actually – I thought he kind of got a raw deal in L.A. History – the immediate history has kind of proved – me wrong on that. It was the right move. They got Stafford yeah. and won the Super Bowl. That's the whole point. We'll see, though, if history favors the Lions, too. Maybe it'll be a trade that works out for both of them. But um, Jared Goff, slightly above average quarterback, just, you know, he's, he's got some tough competition for the history of the Rams to make that top five list. Can't argue that. I mean, I, I love that. And I, I love, I didn't even think about that, Michael. So if he was on the Bears or the Jacksonville Jaguars sure. or you know, he he would actually make a top five list. Very good point. The Rams yeah. have been blessed. Uh, I, you know, at some point, I'm throwing this out there before we move into honorable mention, I, I want to talk you into the Michael Murtis uh, running back project. Nah. <laughs> because the Rams running backs, whether it's Eric Dickerson, Marshall Falk, Stephen Jackson, yeah. Jerome Bettis, Todd Gurley. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Subject for another day, my friend. Subject for another day, <laughs> but for sure. No. I'm going to talk you into that somehow. Okay. Let's start with this honorable mention. Um, I love it. This guy tugs on my heart because I'll tell you, he was the first Rams quarterback I fell in love with as a kid at a whopping 10, 11 years old. Vince Ferragamo. Yeah. His poster hung above my bed, the classic sports illustrated poster. Leads the Rams to the Super Bowl after coming in for Pat Hayden after he busts up a thumb. Mm -hmm. I love that you included him here. Yeah. But he's kind of got a weird narrative, right? Well, he does have a weird narrative. You know, Vince Ferragamo, not a Hall of Famer, but for the Hall of Fame of player names, he's a first balloter. That's a good one, Vince Ferragamo, who oh, I think yeah. Terry Bradshaw referred to as quote-unquote pretty before Super Bowl XIV. <laughs> uh, Vince Ferragamo... <laughs> The narrative on him is twofold. One, that he filled in for Pat Hayden and led the Rams to the Super Bowl that year, 1979. The second narrative was he did squat after that. Yeah. And both narratives are half-truths. He, Even though the, the Rams rallied around Ferragamo 
and get and got into the playoffs with him. He didn't play particularly well in the regular season. It was more like the rest of the team picked it up. He did play better in the postseason, though. Uh, he played really well against the Cowboys, eliminating Roger Staubach for the Oof. final time in his career. And they led in Super Bowl fourteen in the fourth quarter. And he, when the Rams were down with about six minutes left, drove them into Pittsburgh territory until he was picked off and the Steelers ended up winning their fourth Super Bowl in six years. Tough break. but So people think Ferragamo was done after that. Fact of the matter is in 1980, he had the third highest quarterback rating of that year. And that was a real good year for quarterbacks. Brian Seip won the MVP. Ron Jaworski, I think, was the NFC's Offensive Player of the Year. Steve Bartkowski threw for over 30 touchdowns. That was a good year for quarterbacks, and he was one of the very best ones. He, I think, was tied for second in touchdown passes. I think he had 30 that year as well and got the Rams back to the postseason. This time against Dallas, he was a little bit less fortunate. Danny White in the Cowboys defense had his number that day. 1981, he's clearly the number one guy on the Rams, but they're paying him, I think, just over 50000 a year. So <laughs> the owner cool. of the Montreal Alouettes in the CFL says, we'll pay you six times that. So Vince Ferragamo, from a financial sense, wisely says, yeah, I'm getting out of here for a year and taking the money. Does okay with the Alouettes. Comes back in 82 for the Rams. Does okay, although day after Christmas, 1982, Rams hosting the Chicago Bears, Ferragamo throws for 509 passing yards. That was yeah. the second highest single game effort in NFL history. That's not a fluke. Finally, in 83, he has a mixed year. He throws as many interceptions as touchdowns. It's kind of starting to wear down after that. I think the next three seasons, he started 14 games, maybe 12. He, he only won two of them. So short lifespan, but he did have good years in 80 and 82, worth noting, and even an okay year in 83. Yeah. God, you're a font of knowledge, man. I absolutely love this. Love this. So... I couldn't agree more. Uh, it was weird. Of course, I, I tie all the emotions to that narrative in that, uh, yeah, $50,000. I mean, can you imagine that? You couldn't get a quarterback out of bed for that now. <laughs> it's <laughs> right. Yeah. It's nuts. And Ferragamo is he's still active in the Rams uh, community. He does little sports casting. He's in real estate in Southern California. And yeah, he was, I love this mention on the quarterback project. He was ridiculously good looking. And no, still is. Yeah, that was. Like, yeah, he was blessed with that. He, <laughs> he's the poster child when they show quarterback in the uh, dictionary and they have a little picture next to it. It's Vince Ferragamo right next to it, right? Yeah. So that's what you think of. It's true. He still looks like James Bond, even today. It's just ridiculous. Kind of a Bond -esque look. Yeah, he had the hair. That's for sure. That was the Rams back then. We had Joe Namath and Ferragamo backed him up, sat on the bench, and you, you yeah. had these two like great looking dudes. It's, it's crazy. But anyway. Yeah. Love that he makes honorable mention. Interesting tidbit if you're listening in, and I think I shared this with you, Michael. Recently had the pleasure of, inter of interviewing one of my favorite guys in Rams history, Preston Denard, the wide receiver yeah. who played in that, in that Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. He drops a bombshell in the interview that Vince's touchdown that would have changed literally the course of Super Bowl history mm -hmm. in the Rams was the result of a wide receiver running the wrong route. No kidding. And so, right? so I'm telling the quarterback project guy, Vince, just it's just seconds away from a different conversation. Oh, man, that's it. Well, well, we know we've we've seen it in in the Super Bowl and other games before. Obviously, the big one was that Seahawks Patriots Super Bowl. That that's oh. it. One one pass and it, it can change the conversation. So it's um, it's amazing. Good stuff, though. Yeah, love it, man. So I'm glad from an emotional standpoint. I want to tell you, as a, and as a Rams lifelong Rams fan, it's great to see Vince Ferragamo's name up there. Uh, very special player. My first quarterback that hung on my wall, uh, Pat Hayden. Uh, I loved Pat Hayden, but Ferragamo. Sure. He, he kind of gets in that right. That Trent Dilver, uh, Brad Johnson, Mark Rippon, where there's these flashes of greatness for mm -hmm. a short time, and then. Pew, but he definitely go. had it, and most of them don't. So that's something yeah. he has had on. He played in the Super Bowl. There have been a lot of great quarterbacks who haven't. Love it, man. Love your information. So, okay, let's take a look at the top five. We're going to start with number five. Rams fans, we want to hear from you. Hit us both up on Twitter. We'll give you sp spots to do that here at the end. But jumping into the top five Rams quarterbacks of all time is another guy I love. Still a great guy. Wonderful guy to talk to. I've had the pleasure, uh, at least online, and still a big Rams fan, and that is the Blade. Jim Everett comes in yeah. at number five on your list. I think 
that he's underrated. He was absolutely incredible in 88, 89, mm -hmm. le leading the NFL in touchdowns. He did. Yeah, he led him in both of those seasons. So obviously, in 88, 89, he was as good as any quarterback in the NFL. He had, from 88 to 90, all three seasons, he had at least 3,900 passing yards, which, of course, back then, that was a significant accomplishment right there because we still weren't quite in the era where everybody was just slinging the football. So he had a great kind of period of domination right there where he was – in that upper echelon of quarterbacks. And he, even though he's fifth on the list, and a lot of people will probably say, oh, come on, he's got to be at least, you know, four or three. Per the index score that I come up with, which if you check out the site, you'll see, he's just one one hundredth of a point behind the number four guy. Wow. So it's really almost a, a two-way tie for fourth. So if you want to bump him up to a tie for fourth, you can do that too. He, obviously, after 1990, kind of things started to kind of fall apart for the Rams. He, he wasn't nearly as prolific. And I think the real big knock on Everett as part of my analysis, he won 43% of his starts in the regular season in the Rams and had limited success in the postseason, unfortunately, especially that game against the Niners, which was, a, which was a real killer. But <laughs> I can't talk I, I about it. Don't bring it up. I don't remember Super Bowl champion Rams just – Tell yourself that every time you feel bad about something I'm telling you here. But, <laughs> um, but from 88 to 90, uh, Everett was as good as any quarterback in the NFL. So if I were to take a three-year period slice out of all these quarterbacks, he'd be way up there, of course, on any team. And even then, he's a top 100 guy, no problem at all. So Jim Everett, extremely respectable career. And he had a couple good years in New Orleans after that as well, yeah. too, before he kind of uh, went towards the end of his career there and finished up in San Diego, I think. Yeah, that trade in 94 to New Orleans was was a gut punch at the time. It yeah. I, it's funny. I, I look at Jim, and it, again, one of my favorite Rams quarterbacks. I, this list is so right down where I'm at on this list. Is uh, Here's a guy that he, he, he was very Peyton Manning-esque in stature. You know, mm. the same tall guy. He came to us via trade, and he just really put a lot of good work out there. 60 touchdown passes over those two seasons. That was really good. And uh, and to be honest, again, it's emotional outside the quarterback project criteria is this these memories that he posted for us Rams fans. The the walk off touchdown against the Giants to Flipper Anderson mm -hmm. was yeah. unbelievable. Most yardage in a game to uh, to Flipper Anderson. All for why all these yeah, the great memory. And he's he's been really good. That eighty nine NFC uh, playoff game against the Niners. Yeah. Was off. I mean, the phantom sack, he's addressed that he's made fun. He's just such a good natured guy. Between the Jim Rome thing and the Niner thing, he's like, eh, I can laugh at myself. He's just a good guy. If, if I could have weighed in the table flip in the pursuit of Jim Rome, that would have bumped Everett up pretty high on that. <laughs> that was, uh, that's, that's a one we have a laugh about. I'm sure it wasn't as funny for Jim Rome in the moment. But uh, that's okay. We can look back at that. I, I guess finally everything turned out fine. And uh, I have a, a guy who's following me on my uh, on my blog. I think his his blog name is Jim Everett Table Toss. So shout out to you. Thanks for following me. Cool blog oh. name. Follow him if you like the Rams. Oh, I got to go find that guy. Yeah, you do. Okay. That's look at you. Look, at you. look. Look at you. I love it, man. Okay, so number five, Jim Everett, the blade. The numbers speak for themselves. I thought he. Perfect spot here, probably. Perfect spot. Really well done. Let's move into number four. Um, here's a guy that I think comes with some controversy. I'm going to be real honest with you, and I think you're going to know why I think he comes with controversy. Who is number four on the Rams' top five list? Yeah, I've got Mark Bulger at number four. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Mark Bulger. Mark Bulger put up some very impressive numbers and it's really interesting to see again. He's almost Jim Everett esque in that mm -hmm. he was this this lightning bolt flash for a few seasons, and then right. poof, ends up on the Ravens and disappears. Yeah, it yeah. was very strange after winning MVP of the Pro Bowl. Yeah, the Go Bulger. Ahead, you no, know, no, it's okay. Bulger, Bulger was a good one for a few years there. He was he was part of that 2000 draft class. He was drafted 30 players ahead of Tom Brady. Um, along with seemingly everybody else. But that was, it was Bulger, Brady, and Chad Pennington are three guys on my top 100 list who came out of that draft. 
And Bulger was, at the time, the fastest quarterback ever to 1,000 completions. He was. He, it took him 45 games to get to 1,000 completions. It took Warner 47. It took Peyton Manning 48. It took Dan Marino 49. So Bulger had beaten all those guys. I don't know if he still holds the record. I have a feeling he doesn't, but that's not an easy one to look up. Obviously, he, he, had, he had to follow up Kurt Warner. And that's a tough act to follow. 0-2, as we know, Warner's skills are diminishing. He goes 0-6 as starter. And Bulger comes in and wins six out of seven starts. So he's the guy now moving forward, right? I'm sure you remember very clearly on that, Stacey, even though it's in oh, St. Yeah. Louis. Painful. Yeah. And Bulger, he has a couple of Pro Bowl years, 03 and 06. 05, he's on pace to have probably his best individual season. The Rams, aren't, as a team, aren't doing too well but he's averaging 287 yards a game. He's on pace for well over 4,000 yards passing. And that was the season I believe he got injured. I can't, I can't remember the specific injury. So he comes back in 06, obviously has a good year. His last few years were really rocky, unfortunately. I think yeah. from 07 to 09, he started 35 games. He won five of them. Yeah, And that was, and again, his, his lightning in a bottle again, he came out smoking, perfect offense for him, perfect setup. And it finally, just kind of time and injuries caught up to him, and he just kind of, I guess, burned out faster than a lot. Not necessarily emotionally, but just, you know, physically, he just wasn't able to to relive what he had when he started his career, and that that happens. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great analysis. I love him at number four. I, he's always been kind of a bittersweet guy, and that's yeah. absolutely nothing about Mark. He's a great guy, great community, family man. It's just he followed a legend. I mean. Had Aaron Rodgers not been what he is after Brett Favre, it would have been brutal for him. Yeah, uh, I mean, even Steve Young to this day, taking it to the top echelon, is viewed as great. But there's probably a vast majority that goes, yeah, but he's not Joe Montana. You know, you know it's it's yeah. a tough conversation. And Mark did some amazing things. I think the Rams overall at that point started to fall apart. Uh, the Mike Martz era was not kind yeah. to the Rams in history. And Bulger... His personality was perfect for Mike Martz, but once he physically started to break down after winning a couple of playoff games, he, yeah, you knew he was going to be gone, as was Martz, as was the vast majority of that Super Bowl team, even including guys like Torrey Holt, who, that's right, you know, uh, Steven Jackson was there in that era. So I thought it was a good placement for Mark, but I would it be safe to say, in your estimation, that he's probably a little underrated? Oh, just, I definitely say he's. Okay. He, I think he's a guy whose name is almost kind of lost in time. Part, partly because he followed Warner, yeah. and partly because he just didn't have a ton of postseason success. He threw for a lot of yards in the postseason in the three games I think he played. But yeah, he's he's definitely an underrated guy. When he showed up on my list when I first started doing this analysis on the top one hundred, I'm like, oh yeah, he was he was a baller for a few years there, Mark Bulger. Yeah, he was a good one. Another Pittsburgh guy, something in the in the waters of the Allegheny and Monongahela that just churns out quarterbacks. God, that's such a good point. That whole yeah, uh, Jim Kelly, Marino. I mean, it it's just nuts up there. Yep. Yeah, Bulger unfortunately followed an icon and that's tough for him. I mean, he's behind Jim Everett, who we just talked about. They're number one and two in passing yards. Mm -hmm. in Rams history. And nobody would guess that with some yeah. of the players we're about to talk about. It's like, what? Yeah. Uh, but very interesting placement. Uh, shout out to Mark Bulger. He really gave it his best shot there as the Rams, what should have been a dynasty, started to crumble there in those 2000s, those early mid-2000s. Okay. Let's move on to number three on your top five Rams quarterbacks. And I got to tell you, man, I'm sick that this guy isn't in the Hall of Fame. I'm absolutely thrilled to see him on this list Good. right where he is. Who do you have at number three all-time Rams quarterbacks? Yeah, number three is Roman Gabriel. Another great name guy, by the way. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and uh, kind of a joke is that, you know, if you're not a football historian or have a long interest, he's, he's a guy, another guy whose name is kind of lost to history, right? And... I remember when I first started posting on Twitter my original top 100 ranking and I put him on the list and I had a buddy who responded, you just made this guy up. So I guess it's a good, if you're playing a football video game and need to create a player name, Roman Gabriel would probably be a good choice. He was a good one, a real good one. Number two overall pick in 62 out of, I think, North Carolina State. The, the person drafted ahead of him was 
Ernie the Express Davis, who sadly died, I think, a year or two after that. But yeah. he was also, Roman Gabriel, the AFL draft's number one pick that year to the Raiders. And clearly he saw himself being more successful in the NFL. The AFL was still very much in its infancy. It was, they just played their second season. And he didn't exactly get inserted into the lineup right away like a Norm Sneed did. He, for his first four or five seasons, didn't even start double-digit games. Then when finally at the end of the 1965 season, he replaced Bill Munson at the end of the season, he went on a tear where he made 89 consecutive starts, which for a time when quarterbacks got the snot knocked out of them, <laughs> that, that may be his most impressive statistic right there, that he lasted that long without missing a game. He, 1969 NFL MVP, deservedly so, led the NFL in interception rates and led it in touchdown passes, was third in passer rating. Just unfortunately, despite making the postseason twice, didn't have really any postseason success. He played poorly against the Packers in 67, who went on to win the Super Bowl. Played much better his, super, his MVP year in 69 against the Vikings. They were up in the fourth quarter. The Vikings and Joe Cap came back and won. They ended up going to the Super Bowl, of course. And Roman Gabriel wasn't quite the same guy after that, although when they finally traded him to Philadelphia in 73, he had this one last kind of renaissance, comeback player of the year, worthy year that was, you know, just a nice kind of one last hurrah to go out before he kind of weaned the position off to Ron Jaworski out in Philly. But uh, quarterback for 11 years in L.A., when he retired, he was second all time in the lowest interception rate at 3.3%. The guy at that time who was number three was Roger Staubach at 3.9%. So it just goes wow. to show you how good with the football without turning the ball over Roman Gabriel was. So he was he was a good one. He he makes a valid argument for Hall of Fame induction. He probably won't ever get in, but he makes he makes a relatively compelling argument. Yeah. It's gonna be I to your point, it's gonna to be tough for him with the current quarterback situation in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Between that and receivers, yeah. it's like, uh, how yeah, are some of these guys in the 70s, 80s going to get in? I think Roman Gabriel is very underrated. I, your write-up on quarterback project with him was outstanding. I believe yeah. he's still – I could be wrong. I should have looked this up. He remains the Rams' all-time leader in touchdown passes. I. I'll yeah. Take, is that true? Okay. Yeah, he's all-time leader in his 130 starts is by far the most. I think Jim Everett has like 107 and is wow. in second. So he's he's could be Mr. Ram for all intents and purposes. He dominated a decade there and had, had a real good run in LA. And I'll tell you, as the, the old-time Rams fans, the long-timers, I mean, Roman is held in very high. There's plenty of people that say he's number one. That's just the way the way we work. In Ramblad, um, the old timers especially, but I love that he's on this list. And number three, I think, is a really good sweet spot for him. I, it's going to be criminal if he doesn't get in the Hall of Fame. But I tell you, Michael, as I'm reading the quarterback project, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, this, A, your work on this, and these kind of highlights make me realize just what a great team game this is and how mm -hmm. important it's not, we tend to yeah. put all the emphasis on quarterbacks and Roman Gabriel's an example. He, you know, he couldn't win in the playoffs. It, it, that wasn't on him. It wasn't no. for lack of talent. It's a team game. Dan yeah. Marino, you know, Dan Marino's another one. Sure. Uh, and, and Jim, Roman Jim Gabriel, Kelly. Uh, no, hundred percent. And in two Roman Gabriel played in a time where one division winner made the postseason. So they, he played on plenty of good Rams teams. If it had been in a more modern era, he would have had plenty of chances at, at the Super Bowl. Just didn't – competition was too stiff. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. And, and, man, I got to tell you, this is the part on Quarterback Project where I was like, God, I love this blog. Because it really – you do a great job of accentuating the gunslingers. These guys mm -hmm. from the 70s, kind of into the 80s, although it started to turn into high-power offenses – but that 70s, that, you know, the Roman Gabriels, the, you know, the Johnny Unitas at the tail end, uh, oh, yeah. you know, all, Namath in the beginning, just guys who weren't built like Peyton Manning or Patrick Mahomes, but they just came out there beat up and just kept doing it. You got that right. Yeah. Keeping history alive, my friend. I love it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Let's move into number two Rams quarterback great all time. And I got to tell you, this is awesome. Who's your number two greatest Rams quarterback? 
The Dutchman, Norm Van Brocklin, Hall of Famer. Yeah, yeah, big big time. One of the greats. He, he really is. Yeah. And also has Oregon ties. Is ties that right? the, he's got Oregon did he, ties. Did he go University of Oregon, I think? Yeah. He didn't go to uh, Oregon State. You know, I don't remember if he was yeah. coaching or he actually went there. I should know that. I want to say he, he was a duck. I want to say that. You, you might well, be right. I'm a little yeah. embarrassed. I should look that up. To, that's all right. I should have too, I guess. But I'm pretty yeah. sure he was a duck. Yeah. Yeah, he's got Oregon ties. And I'll tell you, Norm Van Brocklin, this, does this kind of fall into your auto Graham category? Sure. It, yeah, yeah. He, the bulk of his work was 1950 to 1960. So he's definitely – he's one of those guys from the 50s. Well, I, I did a whole article on the best quarterbacks of the 50s as well, too. And, of course, he's on the top five list. So you'll have to check it out to see where he landed. But he's on there, that's for sure. Good teaser. Go check it out, folks. Quarterback Project. Yeah. Norbert Brocklin. Now, here is a guy, again, he's not built like an Adonis. <laughs> no, he, no, he was not. Yeah. Old-time gunslinger. And he was a prolific passer at a time when the league was not prolific passing. <laughs> no, no. I mean, well, unbelievable. Yeah, he was – well, you said he stole the NFL record holder – for single season, single game passing yards. He threw in week one of the 1951 season, 554 passing yards. I've got to feel like in today's game, that's got to be the equivalent of throwing 700. I mean, that you just didn't see numbers. You still don't see numbers like that because it hasn't been beaten yet. Yeah. And I mentioned earlier, Vince Ferragamo, that 509 yard game, which I think is still ninth or 10th best of all time in a yeah, single game. It's but 554 is number one. Nobody's broken 530 other than him. And, and that's just one game. But he, along with Bob Waterfield, led the Rams to the NFL championship games in 50 and 51. They lost a heartbreaker to the Browns in 50. But really, Van Brocklin was the guy who won the 51 championship for them, even though Waterfield started the game, and Van Brocklin only threw six passes that game. But when it was 17 all in the fourth quarter, Van Brocklin throws a 73-yard touchdown pass, and that's the difference in the game right there. That's the Rams' second championship. They won one back in the 40s. And then, of course, he takes them back to the championship game in 55 and Otto Graham's last game and Graham had a doozy of a game Van Brocklin did not he got picked off six times and that kind of was the beginning of the end for him in LA unfortunately but played in three NFL championship games in six years for the Rams ended his career in Philadelphia finals in a, like a Peyton Manning he and a John Elway went out on top he won NFL MVP in 1960 wins the NFL championship game as an eagle over the Packers and to Art Starr, 10 playoff games in his career. That was his only uh, only red mark. That was it. He went 9-1. and one. That was his only loss. God, you're a font of knowledge, man. That is absolutely awesome. Yeah, and here's a guy that it's kind of – I say Otto Graham, even though he was older. It, they kind of fall in that category. Oh, that was old-timer stuff, you know. 554. Yeah. Uh, that's without Calvin Johnson, Jerry Rice. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, those are insane numbers by any decade. Yes. Oh, I mean, that's, he was, when he retired, he was the number two all-time career passer. Of course, in an era where they still ran the ball a lot, but he was a quarterback who threw the ball in an era where he ran the football. He was a guy who could be trusted to do it. And he is, he's in the Hall of Fame. He should be. He's one of the, I'll call him one of the forgotten greats because he's a guy whose name should be remembered, but he was just kind of just in that time before the NFL really broke through as the national sport, I think. And, uh, but he, he, he's definitely one of the elites and he had a, had a coaching career after that. I don't know if yep. a lot of people realized first head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, second of the Atlanta Falcons was kind of a notorious ball buster, I guess. And yeah. he didn't get along with his teammates or his, uh, his players and only had a couple winning seasons, one at each stop. And unfortunately it was kind of a heavy smoker and that took his life very prematurely. I think he passed away at age 57, but he, sure. uh, he was, he was a hell of a football player, Norm Van Brocklin. Yeah. God, I love it, man. And I, you do a great job of covering it too on the quarterback project. The, the fact that uh, Norm Van Brocklin was, uh, we had, we had a Joe Montana, Steve Young situation on the Rams mm -hmm. long before that with Waterfield and Van Brocklin, two greats following it. Well, one following the other I, people, I mean, my God, embarrassment of riches during that time. But to think that he started his career splitting time with Bob Waterfield. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, bonkers. I mean, I, I guess the biggest compliment you could give to somebody like Van Brocklin is we already have arguably the best quarterback in the game and we're going to bring another guy in to yeah. alternate with you. So if that's not a compliment of somebody's talent, I don't know what is, but he certainly lived up to the hype, at least for those first four or five years with the Rams there that he, well, he started in 49. So definitely five or six. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Fantastic. And uh, it's really a funny thing. You look at some of these guys that have done that, you know, the Rams, those two, of course, we mentioned Montana Young. We've seen Favre and Aaron Rodgers. We've seen uh, Peyton Manning followed by Andrew Luck. Yeah. Uh, there's just been really interesting and a rare dynamic. So love that Van Brocklin makes number two on this list. And yeah, 554 in any era, folks. We should be shocked. Mahomes hasn't done it. We haven't seen Josh Allen do it. Yeah. We haven't seen Brady do it. Bonkers. All right, man. Good stuff. Okay. Uh, I feel like there should be a drum roll or something, but uh, I don't think there's going to be a lot of shock yeah. here. There might be if you're a Rams fan or just an NFL fan listening. The number one quarterback in Rams history, Los Angeles, St. Louis, Cleveland, mm -hmm. is... Yeah, it's Kurt Warner. And the, really the only reason I guess it would be a shock is because he only played in St. Louis for well, five or six years at the most. I think, right, 99 through 2002 was it? So um, not even that long. And yeah, I, Kurt Warner's numbers speak for themselves. Go on pro football reference and, and take a look at that. But he won 70% of his regular season games. He won 70% of his postseason games. He averaged about 50 total yards per game more in the regular season than the average quarterback. In the postseason, that jumped to 80. He was so pro. He was averaging over two touchdowns a game when your average quarterback was averaging maybe one and a half, which doesn't sound like that big of a difference, but extrapolated over 16 games, that's a huge difference. He was completing two-thirds of his passes when the average quarterback was under 60%. The only real knock on... Warner is he turned the ball over more than average. But if you're going to score all those touchdowns, you get a little bit of leeway, I think. When you're winning when when you're winning games putting up 35, 45, 55 points, you can afford to give the other team a little bit of a break too, I guess. But the, he's uh I'm glad he's in the Hall of Fame cuz he had a hell of a career and boy, those 3 years in St. Louis just you, you, I'd, I'd say you wouldn't believe it in a movie, but they came out with a movie about it. Yeah. So I guess, yeah. <laughs> I got to tell you, man, this is, I think it, we kind of bonded on this when we first met. I know yeah. that you're a big Kurt fan. A I'm big a big Kurt, Kurt fan. fan. Yeah. He's my favorite quarterback all time. Yeah. I, I think that, dare I say this, I think he's a little underrated. Uh, and I think he wouldn't be if it weren't for that kind of donut in the middle where he dealt with some injuries. Yeah. But, I, but that adds to the narrative. He came back from hand injuries from other – he was playing with busted up ribs in that 99 yeah. Super Bowl. And at the at the time, he walked out of there 414 yards, was the most – and was held for the longest time. I think it was just recently broken, if I yeah. remember. Yeah, yeah. It's just – his story is in – it's one of the top yeah. – Stories in NFL history. Unquestionably. It's, Unquestionably. It's, yeah. It's just incredible. Two time MVP, Super Bowl champion. Uh, then to go back with the car, we're not talking about the, that other team, but the Cardinals yeah. and almost win it. Yeah. Again. Almost, almost win it a second time with the Rams against yeah. the Patriots. I mean, he's this close to, and he put both times. He left the field in the fourth quarter with his – I guess it was a tie in, in the yeah. Super Bowl against the Patriots, but uh, put his teams in positions to win. And it just unfortunately went one and two, but you know what? It beats being 0 and 3. So he's got his Super Bowl. He's got his two MVP awards. And he's – you know, a lot of people don't realize, too, he actually started more games as a Cardinal than a Ram. That hurts to hear, but I, I know you're right. Hear, but I think, though, most people are going to associate him as a Ram, and that's and that's what he should be. That's where he got his two MVPs in a Super Bowl ring. But the 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 point to that too that's important is he's one of the all time greats on two franchises. There are very few quarterbacks who can really say that. Uh, Peyton Manning would be one of them. You could make the argument for Fran Tarkenton as well. But point. Uh, he's really one of the few. And I, I just loved watching him play. It's just his accuracy. The game, it, it literally felt like, I know it's cliche, the game 
sped up when the Rams offense was on the field. It was almost like you were hitting a fast forward button, but I, that's been, that cliche has been, the narrative has been run many times over, but let me contribute to it, I guess. Oh, I, man, I love it. I, I know we're both fans and uh, I'll tell you, I, I had the pleasure of meeting him real briefly after a game against the Seahawks during his run and an incredible human being. I saw him take time yeah. with a really sick kid who passed away shortly after meeting him. And he, he, there's just so much to love about that guy. and But his accuracy as a football player, he didn't throw – he makes jokes about the spiral or the lack of. Uh, yeah. But he had uncanny accuracy in windows that no one should have been throwing into. It was, it yeah. was crazy to yeah. watch him. 100%. And I have heard over and over again, the spiral's overrated if it misses the target. <laughs> All that matters is the football is in a position to be caught by the wide receiver. So there's lots of guys who threw pretty spirals who didn't make the Hall of Fame or even play pro football. Good point, my friend. Good point. Yeah, I still – one of my favorite Kurt moments, I've got a bunch of them, but I used to love watching him when he would get under center, when he'd backpedal and he'd spin the ball in his hand. Like yeah. basketball, yeah. like he's just going through his reads. Like this is all so easy. Yeah. Uh, it was it was a special time in Rams history, man. I yeah. as Rams fans listening, let us know what you think of that. Um, Michael's list on the quarterback project, just for review, starting at bottom to top. Number five is Jim Everett. Number four is Mark Bolger. Number three is the great Roman Gabriel. Number two is Hall of Famer Norm Van Brocklin. And number one is a guy we can still enjoy watching on NFL Network. Our number one Rams quarterback is Kurt Warner. That should have been an easy one. I think it probably was, even by your criteria. Yeah. Okay. I, I got to throw a couple of crazy ones out at you here. D different categories not seen on the quarterback project, just because I respect you as a buddy. And oh, <laughs> so, ditto. Let's do it. Okay, my least favorite Ram quarterback of all time is Mr. Tony Banks. He gets a mention <laughs> on the blog. Lots of reasons for that. I don't know him personally, folks. It was just such a brutal thing to watch. <laughs> It yeah, was brutal. <laughs> it's it's too bad because he was, I think, Dick Vermeil, really his first guy there, wasn't he? And the the talent was in not in, he had the talent. He yes. clearly was able to. He had a four hundred yard three touchdown game against the Falcons. He was wow. He, people forget he has a Super Bowl ring. He was the first starter for the Ravens that year. They won the Super Bowl two thousand, but then got replaced by Trent Dilfer. And there's a really good article, and oh boy. It's, uh, I'm going to have to try to remember what site it is, but it's under the Walt Disney umbrella, like ESPN is, and it focuses primarily on the history of key, key black people, oh, key right. black players, the and history. people had an impact on sports specifically. And there was a really good series they did on the history of the black quarterback, and one of the people they interviewed was Tony Banks. And obviously his reputation was he was kind of a last guy in, first guy out, first you know, for practice yep. and, and really kind of learning the game plan. And he he's kind of remorseful about it. It's a really good interview really? in the perspective he gives and how I think for like five years, the Super Bowl ring just sat in a box. He's like, I can't open this because it's not – I wasn't the quarterback who won the Super Bowl. It was Trent Dilfer. It, it's very good perspective wow. from him. And I think he looks back with a little bit of remorse but with a lot of maturity – and so if you get a chance to look it up, it was back in written in 2017, maybe uh, just Google Tony Banks article or Tony Banks interview. Um, he was a great keyboardist for Genesis, though, for those who love their 70s and 80s. Hard rock, so, <laughs> so, he's, so he's my favorite keyboardist, if not my favorite Rams quarterback. Oh, my God. I love you just threw down the, the Genesis reference. That's gold. I got to tell you, man, thanks for mentioning that. I'm going to check that out. I. Yeah, there's, there's. I think there's some some bad feelings under the bridge there for for Mr. Banks. So yeah. I'm really happy to hear that he came clean. I sat next to him in a restaurant once, oh, no and he, in Baltimore. So he was a Raven at that sure. time, okay. and I was still thinking I was really bitter Ram fan guy. Um, but that's good to know. That's good to know. He was just a young guy. I, that was a weird time in Vermeil's Rams history. He had Tony Banks, then we had Lawrence Phillips. I mean, we just yeah. it was a rough time. Good. Good on you. Good on you, my friend. Okay, quarterback I most bleed for in Rams history. I'm going with Sam Bradford. <laughs> yeah. 
It's uh, Sam, yeah. It, it, one, again, another one of those great what ifs in NFL history, right? Yep. And unfortunately, history doesn't know what ifs, but it was, I want to say, what was it, 2013? He was really starting to emerge as a guy who, like, okay, he's he's the number one pick. He figured out the game. He's got a team around him. And then I think, what, did he tear his ACL or attended in yeah. his knee, I think, yep. and missed a year and a half? And he was on pace that year for you know, close to 4,000 yards passing, and he – and that was it for his Rams tenure, right? But 2017, 2016, Minnesota Vikings, he completes 71.6% of his passes and sets a single season NFL record. So he, and then of course the next year, Drew Brees breaks it with 72%. But for one year, he was the most single season accurate passer in NFL history. So the, again, another guy like Tony Banks, the talent was there. But the, the big difference, I think, between the two is just Bradford just couldn't stay healthy. He just could not stay healthy. Yeah. There is nothing I can't throw at you that you don't blow my mind on this, my friend. That is, excellent job. I, I agreed. I, I'm more emotion. You're definitely strong analytical and Bradford was incredible Rams fans dog on him which makes me sick he just got hurt he yeah. was on terrible Rams teams uh, you mentioned the Vikings he also played a little bit I believe under Chip Kelly in Philly he as did. you mentioned Bradford's talent was unquestionable he just couldn't he was getting killed on those terrible Rams teams yeah. and Chris Long even talks about it uh former St. Louis Ram uh, he says Bradford's still a buddy. He says it was just brutal watching Sam. The second time, he just you could just see that his soul was crushed, hurt again. I think Bradford would have been very special as a Ram. Uh, yeah. So good points, my friend. Okay, and just the last guy, no commentary yeah. necessary. I just have a lot of respect for him in the transition. Uh, there were so many transition years with the Rams at quarterback. I really want to tip my hat to Case Keenum under yep. Jeff Fisher and all that. Yep. I just felt like Case came and went, I'm going to play some good football. And he just went out there and gave it his best shot. I, who doesn't root for that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, nice every man kind of story right there. Yeah. Maybe not yeah. the most talented guy, but did everything he could put it all on the, put it all on the field. Right. A hundred percent, my friend. So I'm going to throw something different at you. Mm -hmm. uh, based on the world champion, Los Angeles Rams. Can Matt Stafford make this top five all times Rams list? We know he's going to make the top 100. I'm confident of that. But top five Rams, what do you think it would take for him? After now, he's won the Super Bowl uh, in his first yeah. year. But 99.9% .9 of his career is in Detroit. Yeah. Can we get – is he going to be the Kurt Warner if he gets another one done that goes to another team and jumps onto that team's top five? I don't know about Kurt Warner just because Kurt numbers Warner Kurt Warner's Kurt Warner's numbers were so out of this world for the yeah. time that he was on the Rams. Stafford, though, I mean, I frankly, if he, my minimum criteria is you have to start at least thirty regular season games, so he's thirteen away for next season or however many more seasons. And I think as long as he plays well, he'll probably find his way on the list because I give bonus for winning championships, which is obviously something that. Roman Gabriel, Jim Everett, Mark Bulger, Vince Ferragamo never did. And so that's going to give him a little bit of a boost. And I think he should be rewarded with that. And I think in the grand scheme of things, you that's what you're looking at, right? You're looking at the guy. And it's not like he was the 25th best quarterback and just, you know, had a great running game of defense. I mean, he went out and won that Super Bowl. So he deserves credit for that. So I think he will find his way on this list. And then in exchange for that, though, he obviously won't get the longevity bonus that a guy like Jim Everett or Roman Gabriel right. gets for playing as long. But I, I think by the end of his tenure in L.A., yeah, he's he's going to be on that top five list. God, I love that answer, man. That's great. Because yeah, you know, we feel like we're on the cusp of a dynasty here, especially looking at the NFC West and what a disaster that is right now. Sure. Uh, should be an easier road. So I love it. Matt Stafford, join this list, my friend. Yeah. Let's, let's get this thing done. Okay, Michael, you blow my mind every time we connect and hang out here. Uh, there's your top five Rams fans. Uh, as is tradition on Gridiron Icon, we're going to do this. It's not going to be quite two minutes, but we're going to do a typical two-minute drill with our guest, Michael Mertes of the Quarterback Project. I've got some new questions for you. Rapid fire, two minutes. Here we go. Do it. Based on today, Saturday afternoon, USFL or XFL? <laughs> I don't have the highest hopes for either one. I hate to be the cynic or the pessimist. Let's just say this. 
usually if the rock touches something, it's better than it was before. So since he's got his fingerprints on the XFL, let's let's go with that. Let's see what what they can do this to go around here. Yeah, I feel like they, yeah, USFL is really, you and I talked offline, boys that's struggling. Just watching the empty stadiums, I'm like, it's good yeah, God. It's a shame, but it's not a good look, you know. Yeah, okay. He goes XFL, folks. All right, predictions. Predictions over the next, uh, we'll say two years. We'll give it a bigger window. Joe Burrow or Josh Allen in the Super Bowl? I really love Joe Burrow, and the Bengals have done a lot to try and build up that offensive line around him. Um, like they got Collins from Dallas, for example. I think Allen just has more to work with. He's got Diggs coming back. Uh, he's got Quisenberry from Tennessee, who's going to play guard to kind of help shore up that offensive line. It, it's one of those, it's not a knock on Burrow. It's you're asking me to pick between two winners. And I think Allen has a little bit more motivation after what happened in Kansas City to show I I'm going to go with Allen, but it's almost a coin toss. God, I love it, man. I, I'm leaning your way, just for the record. Yeah. I'm like, I mean, one more I like how you said coin toss, pun intended. Uh, oh, that, that's, that, that overtime well game with Kansas City. Yeah. I mean, one more coin toss. Josh Allen was on fire. I'm really hoping and praying he's not this generation's Dan Marino. Because, well, although I am hoping yeah. and praying that because I want Matt Stafford to beat him multiple times. Okay. There you go. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good Good way of putting it. Okay, two more, and we will get you out of here. Success in the NFL: Malik Willis or Kenny Pickett? Boy, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a real half-assed answer on that one. I Love think, it because <laughs> it's it's so hard to say. What you got here is Willis is the guy who I think is the higher risk, higher reward. I mean, there, is there something to be said why this was not a year where quarterbacks were highly valued in the draft? And Willis is, is he, he he's a little bit less. He's a little more turnover prone than Pickett is, He, but he's got mobility that Pickett doesn't have. Pickett had five, I think, games last season where he had four or more touchdowns. So he can play, but you just don't know when you get to the NFL level talent. And both the Titans and the Steelers, based on pro football focus, have – average offensive line. So if the hope is that in the next year or two, one of these guys is really going to take over the team, there's not a ton of stuff to make you say, oh, that's a that's a guarantee right there. It, and that's, it's another coin toss. I'll say this. Pickett's the safer bet, but Willis is going to be the guy who who has the chance of being the greater quarterback. How's that sound? Okay, man, that was I, that, that was a really good uh, half-ass answer. I Thank you. I <laughs> appreciate it. it. better. I, I, no, I'll tell you, I, I didn't like either of them as starters in the NFL. I'm yeah. just going to be candid, so I wanted to get your take on that. I think Pickett's going to have more chances early, that's for sure. Yeah, I think so, too. Okay, final question that we're going to get you out of here, my friend, on this long weekend. What are we watching this weekend? And if the answer's nothing, that's okay, too. But fans want to know, what is Michael Murtis doing when he's not crunching quarterbacks? Okay, <laughs> Stranger Stranger Things or Obi-Wan Kenobi? I'm not the Star Wars fan I used to be. I yeah. will say this, though. I still enjoy it. I, and The Mandalorian was a very pleasant surprise. So if if they can recreate that magic, I'll, I'll go with Obi-Wan on this one. I, I need the Force wow. with me. So we'll uh, go with that. The Force is strong in this one. Uh, <laughs> I could tell you I've watched the two episodes of Obi-Wan. Even if you're an old Star Wars fan, go check it out. All right. Very impressed. Very impressed. Yeah. Subject for a whole other podcast. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. Every time I have you on, I get smarter. Folks, please check out Michael Murtis' work. Even if it is just a passion project, I'm pushing him to make it even bigger. I think it's bigger. Uh, you can find him at quarterbackproject.wordpress.com or on Twitter at QB Project Blog. If you want to talk directly to Michael, where else can we find you? Is there anything I'm missing? Right now, that's it. You got the two big ones. So we'll see if I expand my social media imprint. Although that said, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I have sort of recalculated my index scores for my quarterbacks. And I'm coming out with a new top 100 list. I'm going to each day up until opening kickoff this season, go down from 100 to 1. So each day I'll have a different quarterback. So if you want to check that out, uh, of course, I always welcome feedback 
and uh, just, uh, yeah, give it a shot. See what you think. Tell me why I'm an idiot. I, I appreciate that, too. <laughs> Not an idiot. God, I love it. Teaser, folks. Teaser. I mean, that grab an adult beverage day by day, walking us through the top 100 quarterbacks of all time doesn't get any better. My friend, thanks a million for joining me on a long weekend. And I couldn't have loved your top five Ram list anymore. Uh, folks, like, subscribe on all the usual podcast platforms and on YouTube and go follow Michael Quarterback Project. It is the next big thing in QB analysis. I'm going to keep pushing it. Thanks, my friend. Go have a safe weekend. You got it. You too, Stacey. Thanks again. Appreciate it.